That works. <laughs> Can you hear me? No? Yes. Is it on? Yes. Yes, you can hear. Okay. Thank you all again for coming um, to the last of the season Plain Sight lecture series with David Rattray and Donna Marie Barnes. Donna is from um, Donna Marie's from Sylvester Manor. David is the editor of our local paper, the East Hampton Star. Um, we hope to potentially do this again next season, maybe also to bring a similar, if not the same, series to Sylvester Manor. Um, you can hear me? <laughs> anyway, um, what I want to say is, if you would kindly, at 5 o'clock, if you're, if you're here and you've reserved a seat for the concert, you're welcome to stay. If you haven't, we're limited to 50 people on the property officially, so I have to just ask you to exit efficiently. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you had a beautiful summer. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for coming. Again, I'm Donna Marie Barnes, and I'm the curator and archivist at Sylvester Manor Educational Farm uh, on Shelter Island. And together with David, we represent what we call the Plain Side Project which is a project that we started a few years ago, how many years ago? Four, let's say four years ago, where uh, David had started to, with some volunteers to do some research and an investigation into trying to uncover the names and uh, to count the, the number of enslaved persons who lived here in East Hampton. And when the list had grown to about 300 individuals, he came to visit me at Sylvester Manor and told me about the project, and we've been working together on it ever since. And so this summer, and we thank Duck Creek so much for this opportunity to, uh, to be here to present these, these presentations about the work that we do and the stories that we tell. And this one as our, as our last appearance here in the David and Donna Marie Traveling Show. Uh, for this season. For this season, absolutely. We are taking bookings for the fall and winter. Uh, we'd less like to say that this has been a marvelous experience for us to, to tell these stories publicly, to expand our audience, to share them with more and more people. And it's really energized us, and despite the uh, the circumstances of the summer of the season and the fact that you're not close to us or each other this has been a, a really wonderful time um, in terms of bringing our work to light energizing us for the future and showing us the path forward of, of what's next and there's always something next there's, so, there's a new discovery to make every day there's a new name to uncover, there's a new life to bring to the forefront, and new histories to tell. Um, this fall we hope to also engage more communities in doing similar kinds of projects as the Plain Sight, or to join with us in the Plain Sight project. We are working on curriculum to present to schools because uh, the original volunteers were students, and David will talk more about that. And so to bring it to other school districts on the East End to make that count grow um, and to continue to build the stories that we love to tell. So the reason we call it the Plain Sight Project is because uh, these records of enslaved people are actually in plain sight. Uh, they were just overlooked for... Um, certainly 250 years. When the first histories of Long Island were written, uh, there was only really a passing mention of slavery, if at all. And consequently, generations of people have grown up here and throughout the Northeast not understanding that, that enslaved people, both indigenous uh, and of African descent, really were, were ubiquitous and um, were really a common presence in almost any town you can point to in colonial southern New England, colonial Long Island, uh, New Amsterdam, although the Dutch had a slightly different 
take on slavery. Um, you know, some people sort of say it's more, the, it was a little bit more benign in New Amsterdam, but there's certainly plenty of uh, enslaved people from New Amsterdam who try to escape to English territories, and uh, it, it, is, it is not freedom. Um, by any means, even if it is a slightly more flexible system among the Dutch. Um, what became really clear early on in this process, I can describe their process in some detail in a bit, is that slavery and the economic output and of enslaved people was absolutely essential to the building of East Hampton. There's just no question that without that labor force, this would be a very, very different community. And I think that the importance, this is somewhat speculative, but I think the importance may have diminished over time in the 180 roughly years that there was slavery here. But certainly they were doing everything. Um, they were providing the muscle to grow crops. They were carrying crops to the port to go to market. They were taking care of houses and children and whaling. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's free blacks as well. It's this extraordinary story that we're just at the beginning of. And as you were talking, Don Marie, I was thinking about that, is if we are really at the beginning of a process, not just in East, you know, in East Hampton Town as well, Sag Harbor we haven't looked at at all, really Bridgehampton we haven't looked at. Um, at the moment, we're up to about 300 enslaved people in East Hampton. We have another roughly 200 in South Hampton, just at a cursory look. And we think ultimately we may be able to identify about a third of the total. Based on census numbers, it seems to indicate that in all, East Hampton at some point may have had around 1,000 enslaved people over that 180 year period. Um, but we're only going to be able to ID about a third. And we can go into some detail why I think that is. But um, it's kind of a, a, an amazing number. And people say, well, it's a thousand. You know, that's not like the plantation system or in, in uh, Brazil where hundreds of thousands of enslaved uh, people were brought. Um, but I think you have to think, and the way we've always thought about this is, is in terms of individual people. And not as a vast number. And the experience of slavery to one person is an inhumane tragedy. And that doesn't matter if it's one person or a thousand people. It's, it's, it is a, a legacy that, that we share as Americans and we don't understand as Americans. We, we think of it as an isolated southern phenomenon. And we are just amassing data to show that it it isn't. This is our collective history. And also because it's not masses of large numbers, thousands and thousands of people, we are able then to present them as individuals. So when we find a name, and it's, it's always an exciting discovery to discover a name in an account book, in a last will and testament, on a census record, and then to be able to find other small details about these lives. Now, we're not talking about, you know, written descriptions. We're talking about a name and maybe a purchase of a pair of shoes or a name and that person had a new bed. There are these little fragments of, of their lives. We are often able to identify the homes that they lived in. In, at Sylvester Manor, obviously it's one place, so it's one house and it's one family, um, and so it's it's a slightly different circumstance. But even finding multiple mentions of, of a person, of Matilda, of Comus, and being able to further the, the scope of their lives to give them larger sense of agency is an exciting piece. And in being able to tell those stories to audiences like you, we are recreating this. And it, and it makes it not as anonymous. These are not anonymous people. You know, we can say there was slavery in East Hampton, there was slavery on Shelter Island, there was slavery, slavery throughout Long Island and the East End. But being able to name individuals 
who lived here and be able to say, John lived in that house that you pass every day going, going through Main Street of East Hampton has a certain significance. Being able to tell you that a family of African descent, Hannah, Jacaro, and Ho their daughter Hope were the first African family of Shelter Island is very significant. We know the first child who was born at Plymouth Rock or in Jamestown. And I can tell you that the first black child born on Shelter Island was named Isabel. And she was the daughter of Jacaro and Hope. And she was enslaved for her entire life. That makes her a significant person of the founding of the place. And that's really what the significance of what the Plainside Project is all about, of giving people significance in a particular place. Our place, this is not just any place. We are all here because this is our community. This is our home. Some of us have very, very deep roots like David and others whose families go back to the, to the origins of the town. But they were not here alone. They were here with the indigenous people, and they were here with the enslaved people that they forced to be here. And the three cultures built this place for us. And it's our responsibility now to understand that, to uncover it, to talk about it, to acknowledge it, to celebrate it, and to learn from it as we move forward. Because we were not here alone. We were here together. Really, through one of the things that I hope this project can do is move the, the needle a little bit about the American origin myth. Um, we were all taught about the pilgrims, and I, mean, I think in, in schools they still make the paper hats at Thanksgiving. They certainly make the little turkey things. And they, you know, the story is told kind of as these noble religious separatists and Squanto, the guy who taught them about putting the bunker fish in the, in the corn hills. Um, and that's kind of the end of ethnic diversity in the American <laughs> story for the first 200 years. Well, it's not, of course, it's not true, and we can demonstrate it's not true. The, the gardeners, um, Lyon and Mary Gardner, who were the first um, English uh, to, to settle on Long Island, Southampton came later, um, had enslaved people. We, we know this. Um, there's this, what's called a slave cemetery on Gardner's Island. There's a building, I think it's gone now, but it was called the, the Slave Quarters. Um, so the earliest reference we have right now in East Hampton to an enslaved person is 1654, and it's a, a boy who goes missing on Gardner's Island. Um, whether it was a runaway or murder, you know, one form resistance often took was people taking their own lives. Um, we don't know his name, but the next two people we do know, it's Boos and Jaffet. And Jaffet's fascinating because he, it, it's more of a question than anything else. So there's a Jaffet here in 1657 in East Hampton. He, uh, six, uh, yeah, 1657, and subsequently in a will in, in um, 1665, there's a Jaffet who turns up at Sylvester Manor in Shelter Island, and then subsequently there's a free black in the beginning of the 18th century who's signing, signing a whaling contract here to join a whaling company. Now, we don't know if this is the same man or descendant, but there is a fascinating thing is it names, as you probably know, a lot of enslaved people just had one name. Um, they, they would be, uh, you know, Toby or Cato, and, and a lot of these sort of Old Testament or Greek names, it, and it's fascinating, you can absolutely tell who's an enslaved person and, and who isn't when reading these old records because of the sorts of names. You get very quickly familiar with what is a white name and what is a black name, um, and it's really apparent. And there's, there is some, you know, Mingo is, is another person we're fascinated with. Um, Hope, interestingly enough, turns up as name of enslaved person, but you're never really gonna see an Elizabeth. You might see a, a Betty or a Becky, but I'm sort of digressing. Um, 
we got interested in a guy by the name of Shem, and I've written about him in, in the paper. Uh, and Shem's fascinating because at around the turn of the 19th century, he's part of a crew with Nathaniel Dominey who go over to Gardner's Island to cut timbers. There were no longer adequate timbers on the mainland here to build windmills with. And so they truck over there. And so he goes, uh, Nathaniel Dominey, I think this is five, Dominey, Nathaniel Dominey five, with two Indian boys and a man uh, who's described as, I think, a Negro named Shem. And they row over, and it's a winter day, and they spend a couple of days uh, felling the timbers and squaring them, and then trucking them back across the bay and sledging them in, into town here. Now, Shem was enslaved earlier in his life, we believe. We don't know whether he was free or enslaved at that point, when in, in uh, 1805, 1806, that winter when, when he went to Gardner's Island. Um, the Dominies were sort of meticulous record keepers, and there's no record of Shem being paid anything, although there are records of other Black East Hamptonites being paid. So my suspicion is that he was still enslaved. So what's fascinating about Shem, and Donna Marie this morning text, texted me that she's, you're looking at what? It was the familysearch.org? Yeah. So, okay. So a, a couple of days ago we did another talk and David was talking about Shem and finding another individual later on whose first name is also Shem but who has taken the last name of Gardner. And so before we had our conversation this morning, I thought, well, I'll just look up Shem Gardner. And I, I looked him up on Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org and found multiple records for a black man named Shem Gardner, born in 1808 in East Hampton, who went to live in, as an older man back to Gardner's Island. And so here we had a mention of Shem with uh, Nathaniel Dominey building the hook mill. And then another man, possibly his son, who seems to have taken or is related to or had been previously owned by the Gardeners, who adopts the last name of Gardner. And we can then follow him all the way until 1883. So this is a way, and, and this is an example of how the excitement of, a, of an emerging story happens. David mentions Shem Gardner Thursday. I decided to just spend a little time looking him up and got very excited when all of these records then emerged. So we are telling these stories almost in real time. Yeah. It's <laughs> and it's often the way I do the, the genealogy research. He just <laughs> uncovers the name. <laughs> Yeah, and I forget the dates, you remind me. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> but you, you know, you use the word story, which is an interesting one. And, and the reason I think we use the word story and stories is because of the value of the human imagination. And what we try to do is put a picture in your mind, basically. <laughs> um, 1699, um, I think it was... Captain Mulford's Negro man on June 6th helped weed the Reverend Nathaniel Hunting's corn plot on East Hampton Main Street. Um, now, if I'm successful, I've put a picture in your mind of an unnamed enslaved man, 1699, pulling weeds. And, and we think there's just extraordinary power in that, in, in humanizing the enslaved and making them inseparable from the rest of the stories about East Hampton, which frankly, there aren't that many that are told. There's Bishop Smulford, you know, and they named a political party out of him, uh, after him, and you know, the whaling and the fishing and this and that. Turns out, you know, a lot of that went on, but um, you know, the, our sense of what passes for history in East Hampton is really quite skewed. Now, for example, We've looked at hundreds of pages of account books, and one thing you don't see in these account books, because, you know, let me just pause for a second. There, there wasn't really any cash in those days, so the way you transacted business was that if I gave Donna Marie, or Donna Marie gave me a cheese, 
we would note the value of that cheese, but I would have a debt to her that I could pay off in goods, I could work it off, I could um, die and leave that debt to my heirs. Um, but that meant that Donna Marie keeps a set of books and I keep a set of books so that we keep each other honest. So there's transactions and transactions, and we've looked at transactions of every conceivable sort. What you don't see is fish. Now that's strange, because we're told that East Hamptons is farming, fishing, hard scrabble, whalers, and my grandmother was guilty of telling that story. And certainly people did fish, but these were agrarians. These were livestock people. These were farmers. They're growing flax. They're, they're um, weavers. They're leather workers. Um, fishing which we think of as kind of the, the icon of, of East Hampton identity, relative to what was going on in the 17th and 18th century, uh, really is not economically important. And, and that is really something, and it points to just how little we really do know of, about even a place that we think we know a lot about. I think we should also mention that we are not historians. We are not you know, academically trained historians, we are both have backgrounds in journalism, and so we are, in fact, storytellers. Uh, my background is as a photographer and, and photo editor and photojournalism, and so I'm a visual storyteller. But when we, when we come across these individuals and these names and we're, we're putting together these, these lives, it does come across as stories, and we have to use a certain amount of imagining and, and imaginary license that perhaps a strict you know, historian, academic historian would not do. And so in, in building a story, we are using our imaginations to fill in those blanks, to say that you know, in an account book, a man named Cato has uh, six pairs of shoes in one year. And you have to ask yourself, why would he have six pairs of shoes in one year? What was he doing? Who did he belong to? And what was, what was their profession that would make Cato have to go through six pairs of shoes? Did he, was he a messenger? Did he walk long distances? And just asking the questions makes you imagine the life. And from that comes the story. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of a, a story, first person, in, in a minute. But I do want to say that... Um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do as we move forward with this project is to expand it to other communities, um, both on Long Island and, and in Connecticut, and Southern New England. Um, you know, I, I think we really want to demonstrate the presence and economic con con contributions of enslaved people and free people of color um, to the American story. And, you know, driving over here, I passed a couple of Black Lives Matter signs, and I was thinking, like, what a strange phrase that really is, and that we have to, we have to say that as if black, black Americans are somehow separate. And it, of course, there is a, a sense of separation, but it's not based on fact, because the fact is, and we can demonstrate that black Americans were here at the very beginning. Um, and that the economy of the North was as dependent on slavery as any part of America during its, its growth and expansion years. Um, so we're talking about 1650, 1657, you know, 1699. The cotton gin, you know, we have this vision of, of slavery as, you know, King Cotton. Cotton gin's not invented until 1793, which means that you've got more than a century, and, about a century and a half of slavery going down right here before the device that makes King Cotton possible even is invented. Um, there's no way to separate American history from the history of slavery, uh, even in the earliest days, and especially in the earliest days. Um, and so going forward, well, that's one of the things we want to do is, is sort of grow this into other communities. We are talking to um, 
potentially some uh, uh, academic at uh, Stony Brook to, to partner to have students going into uh, archives that we can't reach. There's a wonderful uh, project out of Hofstra where they're digitizing his, at no cost historical society's holdings and preserving them essentially. That there's there's some so you know fifty or a hundred tiny little historical societies on Long Island. Um, this is a great moment to be doing this this kind of work because there's a lot of digitization going on. There's a lot of interest in in Black Lives um, and the and and the this, this black story um, so that's really one of our our dreams and I, it's starting to happen we have a group in South Old who, who seems interested in doing this um, Seg Harbor just emailed to say come over look at through our records um, so we're using volunteer labor we're hopefully some student um, student labor um, you know to to grow this database and we don't want to be um, activists in a sense, but, but we're perfectly happy if activists take the foundation that we can provide, straight up data, right. and do something with it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the one to say we should have a lecture series or a, you know, a monument or a, you know, a prize or something. I, I don't know. That's for the community to decide, but what we can do is provide these stories and, and you know, this mountain of names. Um, where are we at? No, you tell your story. I'm going to look for it. Okay. So we thought for this last event that we would actually uh, sort of tell you a story and tell you how we found the story. So uh, we have done a lot of research and the, the, starting from the beginning of the establishment of East Hampton of Shelter Island from the 17th century, early 18th century. Now, in New York, slavery is abolished in 1827. In 1799, there was a partial uh, abolition of slavery, but it was complicated. There was a lot of fine print, but slavery is abolished in New York in 1827. <clears throat> However, indentured servitude was not abolished then. It went on for some time. And one of our stories at Sylvester Manor um, that's very meaningful and powerful in our history, concerns two indentured boys. They were Montaukett Indian uh, from East Hampton, and they were placed in indentured servitude at Sylvester Manor. And finding the history of these two boys, and I, I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second, um, there are some physical remnants of them at the Manor House. The Sylvester Manor House on Shelter Island, and you're all invited, please come visit. Uh, the house is closed, but the grounds are open. In the Manor House that was built in 1735, in the attic space is where we believe the enslaved and the indentured people lived. Freezing in the winter, stifling in the summer. And when these two young boys were brought to the manor, this is where they lived. And I'm going to read you the, the transcript of the indenture paper for one of the boys. They were brothers. Let me pause for one second and explain why indenture is basically a life sentence because of the life expectancy being low. I mean, we think of indentures, you know, as you learn a trade and then you're free. It didn't really work that way. Indentures could be sold. Um, they could, in the process of being sold, be extended. Uh, and particularly among indigenous people, uh, it was basically slavery by an, another name. So, within the papers of the Manor House one day, I found a document with beautiful handwriting, and I have a copy of the original that I can show you after this is over. And reading the script, making out the words, and, and having this reality sort of come into focus for me, this is what it said. This indenture made the 16th of November in the year of our Lord, 1829. William Pharaoh, son of Joseph Pharaoh and Esther Pharaoh of the tribe of Montauk Indians, aged eight years, nine months, and seven days, by and with the consent 
of said Esther Pharaoh, his mother, the said Joseph Pharaoh, his father, being dead of the said tribe, to dwell with and serve him the said Samuel S. Gardner, his heirs and assigned from the date of these present, until he shall arrive at the full age of 21 years of age, which will be on the seventh day of February in the year of our Lord, 1842. During all which term of time the said William, his said master, his heirs, and his signed, well and faithfully shall serve his lawful commands, do and obey the good of his said master. He shall not embezzle or waste nor lend them to any without his consent. He shall not at any time defeat or absent himself without his master's leave. But in all things, as a good and faithful servant shall demean and behave himself towards his master, during the above said term of his servitude. And said master doth covenant and engage that he will find and follow unto his said servant sufficient meat, drink, washing, lodging, and apparel, for which a servant during the above mentioned term, and to teach him to read and write, and at the expiration of his servitude to give him all his common wearing apparel and a new suit of clothes and $25 in cash. Now, William, as it said, was eight years old. His brother Isaac, and there's another paper just like it, was five years old. Their mother, unable to care for them, had been given $27 by Samuel Smith Gardner to place her sons in his care and indentured servitude. Now, we don't know what the circumstances were for Esther, but these two little boys, five and eight, were brought to Sylvester Manor, placed in the attic to sleep, and lived there, they were to live there until they were 21 years of age. Now the evidence that we have of their lives in the attic is carved on the walls themselves. There are 43 carvings, drawings of ships that range in shape from simple triangles for sails to elaborate riggings of a clipper ship. And we believe that through the years of their growing up, they carved these ships onto the walls above from where they slept. It's an amazing piece of evidence of, of these two children who lived there. And for a while, that was all the evidence that we had. Um, that they lived there, that they carved these, these ships, and we believe that they were then either buried in the burial ground that's on the, on the grounds at Sylvester Manor, but then one day, in a suitcase in the basement, stuffed with papers, I found another letter, which sort of furthers the story of William. And I'll read that quickly. It says, oh, sorry. It's dated the 24th of August, 1840. Dear Mr. Gardner, I must state to you an unpleasant event that has taken place since you left home on the 19th. On the 22nd, Saturday morning, we could not find your William. At 10 o'clock, Mr. Rafe went to Greenport, and a captain there informed him that William and Isaac were seen at Greenport in the evening, and that a sloop sailed from there at 11 o'clock at night for New London. William had returned home with Isaac at 9 o'clock, appeared to be going to bed, but his clothes are gone. I hope you will find out how he got off the island. And so, suddenly, as I went screaming through the halls, <laughs> William ran away. Now to further this story and put it in context, Mr. Gardner is away because he has taken his two eldest daughters, Mary and Phoebe, to boarding school at the Albany Female Academy. And they left, as the letter says, on the 19th. Now, living in the attic, William would have had to have come down the stairs, which are referred to as the slave staircase, past the first floor bedrooms where Mary and Phoebe would have slept. And these children were all the same age, so they had grown up together. And if they had heard him on the stairs, might have called out and said, William, where are you going? But they weren't there. They had been taken to boarding school. And he saw his chance, and he crept down the stairs in the night, 
and either had prearranged with his ship to pick him up off the coast of Shelter Island, and he sailed away. He was 19 years old, and there was a year and a half left of his service, but he could not wait another moment. He had drawn these ships all of his life, and he had dreamed of going to sea, and he seized his chance, and he went. But he left his 16-year-old brother Isaac behind. Now, so far, I've not been able to find out what happened to William Farrow, but we know that Isaac stayed, fulfilled his years of service, and remained at Sylvester Manor and worked for the rest of his life and he is one of the last people buried in the burial ground. So you see from these two pieces of, of documentation, I've been able to put together this whole, this life to tell you this story. And it's such a deep and rich story, it's almost, it's almost cinematic. <laughs> at, at, at one point, Donna Marie speculated to, to me that um, <clears throat> William was interested in one of the sisters at uh, boarding school was... <laughs> yes, heartbroken. <laughs> yeah, heart <laughs> ran off. Um, so one of the things that sort of in my list of why wasn't I told, which is kind of a sub-theme, obviously, of this, um, it's kind of outrageous, really. So there's a guy by the name of Venture. He eventually becomes Venture Smith. Um, he publishes a book in 1798, uh, and it was called... Uh, a narrative of the life and adventures of Venture Smith, a native of Africa, but resident above 60 years in the United States of America, related by himself, New London, printed in 1798. The thing about Venture Smith was he was enslaved on Fisher's Island, which is part of South Old Town. Um, crazier than that, he and a um, Irish indentured servant, let's see if we can find this passage, it's really quite good, uh, decide to escape at a certain point, and they end up in Montauk, of all places. The Irish indentured servant steals his clothing. Oh, here it is. This is really good. Um, After I'd lived with my master 13 years, being then about 22 years old, I married Meg, a slave of his, who was about my own age. My master owned a certain Irishman named Hetty, who about the time formed a plan of secretly leaving his master. After he had long had this plan in meditation, he had suggested it to me. At first I cast a deaf ear to it and rebuked Hetty for harboring this in his mind such a rash undertaking. By the way, this is dictated to an abolitionist. And you, these so-called slave narratives have a certain kind of style that's pretty uniform, but but the details are unique and it, it generally thought of as being pretty accurate. Uh, at any rate, so they're going to, uh, Hetty inveigled two of, inveigled, right? I mean, maybe, you know, maybe Venture used the word inveigled, but I kind of doubt it. Um, <laughs> but here it is. Okay, so uh, inveigled two of his fe fellow servants to accompany us. The place to which we designed to go was the Mississippi. Our next business was to lay in a sufficient store of provisions for our voyage. We privately collected out of our master's store six great old cheeses, two firkins of butter, and one batch of new bread. When we had gathered all of our own clothes and some more, we took them all about midnight and went to the waterside. We stole our master's boat, embarked, and then directed our course for the Mississippi River. We mutually confederated not to betray or desert one another on pain of death. We first steered our course for Montauk Point on the east end of Long Island. And then things sort of turn bad from there and Hetty runs off with the clothes and, and at any rate. But so here you have this narrative, a slave narrative, first person account, where they end up at Montauk to, to get water and further provisions. I mean, why wasn't I told? I mean, this is kind of outrageous that the schools aren't, for example, at least reading this single passage to students. It's absolutely crazy. And um, that's, I think, one of the things that's so outrageous about the lack of knowledge is it's not difficult. This stuff is right out there. And it is, you know, it was willfully um, neglected. I mean, maybe the, the, the Civil War was too painful. Um, in collective memory, or I, I don't know why as Americans we did it, you know? But Venture Smith is an important person uh, 
for Long Island, for, off the coast of Connecticut, in Connecticut, as, as an, an enslaved person who gains his freedom, writes his life story, beginning from his capture as a young boy in Africa. Yeah. He is, this story, this is a founding father's story. And it's one that I think we should all know. It's, it's very rich, it's exciting, it's got adventure. However, why enslaved people would be running away from Connecticut to go to the Mississippi <laughs> <laughs> was maybe not fully thought out. Um, so we're getting a high sign. So I think at this point, we're going to ask if there are any questions. Yes. Slavery in the Northeast was primarily of people of African heritage. Um, Native American slavery was present early, and it was problematic for a variety of reasons, um, one of which was that it was easier for an uh, indigenous person to run away here. Uh, there were Confederates. Um, Venture Smith helps us with understanding where uh, people came from. And th this is repeated over and over again. So he's loaded on a ship on the coast of present day Ghana uh, when he is about six or seven years old. And the ship crosses the Atlantic and ends up at Barbados. It initially is loaded with uh, 260 captives of which 200 survive. Most of them are sold at Barbados except for venture and two or three other people who are brought up here. Uh, I think about aboard the same boat, and may, may, maybe they switch boats, but that's a very, very common story where the initial uh, uh, contact on this, in this hemisphere, or this, this side of the, of the Atlantic, is, is in the sh on the Sugar Islands. Yes. So, and also on Shelter Island at Sylvester Manor, the enslaved people were brought from the West Indies. Sylvester Manor was originally established as what we call a provisioning plantation to supply uh, this consortium of partners' uh, operations on Barbados. They own two sugarcane plantations. And so the enslaved people were brought from the West Indies to Shelter Island initially. Yes. And the whole sort of connection between this part of Long Island, the eastern part of Long Island, uh, southern New England, up to uh, uh, Rhode Island, economically they were connected to the West Indies, to the sugar operations in the Caribbean, because they were providing them with raw materials of, of, of wood and livestock and, and food pr provisions, because they were making so much money on sugar that they were not growing food, they were not uh, you know, cultivating any other kind of crops, and their enslaved workforce were literally starving to death. It, it's one of the things that we're going to do in in the coming years, really spend a lot of time trying to document uh, crops and products from the Northeast, from Long Island, uh, going to the Caribbean. There are some uh, indications, there's a wonderful accounts of uh, gardeners herring horses and barrel staves ending up in Haiti and being sold to uh, sugar plantations there. And um, that's one of our, I suppose, smoking guns. But there's, there's endless more. And one of the things that is fascinating is, you know, Montauk, maybe there's 200 people living in East Hampton, say, in 1806, and Montauk might have 3,200 head of cattle, another 4,000 sheep and hogs. And so you say, well, what, you know, what are they doing with this much livestock? Um, for the most part, they're salting it, taking it to market, and one of the markets, and perhaps the market for these products, would be in the Sugar Islands. Whether the enslaved people were eating Montauk beef, I sort of doubt, 
but there are uh, there's the planters themselves there's a merchant class in the emerging cities in the sugar islands who absolutely are going to want beef and pork and uh, yeah any any other questions sarah how are your um, white founding families engaging with your project or responding or feeling about all of this yeah, we were talking about this morning. Um, we have found pretty positive uptake. Um, I talked to a, an old member of the Mulford family. The Mulfords are interesting. The Mulfords were about the biggest enslavers after the gardeners. Um, and we, of course, we have Mulford Farm, in, you know, which is this uh, sort of iconic building in the heart of Old East Hampton. Um, and this is a Mulford, I think he's in his 70s, and he's sort of retired to live in the Carolinas somewhere. And he said, yeah, I always sort of suspected. And I said, well, does it bother you? And he said, no, I, I don't, I'm, I'm curious. I want to know about this. Now, a, a member of the Domini family, on the other hand, pushed back pretty hard. And she said she was waiting for incontrovertible proof that, that her family had ens enslaved people. She was polite, but <laughs> she really did call up to say, what, what do you mean my family owns slaves? Um, but generally, I've talked to some Osborne, some Dayton's. Um, uh, it's a shocker, but it is. I think people are. You know, what about Shelter Island? What about what's the uh, take over there? Well, beyond the manor, you know, I haven't really involved anybody, but um, <laughs> uh, it has always been a part of our mission at the manor to tell the stories of all the people, and that has come from the descendants themselves. And so that's part of our mission, to preserve, cultivate, and share the stories of all the people. Um, and so it's, they're totally supportive and behind the work that we're doing. Now, we do hear that in uh, Orient and parts of South Hold, there are some old families who are pretty uptight about this examination. Um, we, we just haven't experienced that here. Yeah. Um, People seem pretty enthusiastic to, to know. I mean, it was a shocker for me, and I was far into this project when I thought, oh, I ought to look and see if any of my ancestors were enslavers. I think I was like a year in, something like that. And, you know, it, it, you get a cold sweat when you realize, oh, my God, you know, my daughter's middle name is Hunting, named after, ultimately, Reverend Nathaniel Hunting, who was the second minister here, and he and many of his descendants were enslavers um, you know I've, I've got ancestors here you know six ways to Sunday that that were enslavers oh which is interesting and we don't have time for this but the but the language um, enslaver has come to mean really anybody who held captive people in a state of slavery it doesn't mean they are you know the person who ran the the, the slave pens in Africa or something like that. Um, I mean, that's an important distinction. That's a fairly new piece of the puzzle, but it does, it does affect a little bit how you might think about it, in that every morning that you are still holding someone in bondage, right. you're an, you are continuing to enslave that person, yeah. making you an enslaver. So, so is that the preferred terminology now, as opposed to slave holder? As, as opposed to slave owner. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and yeah. we inf we refer to the individuals who were enslaved, not as slaves. Right. Good. Right. I mean, the idea that no no one is a slave. Ultimately. Sarah, you have a follow up no, question. <laughs> okay. My follow up question is how uh, I've seen Donna Marie's uh, calendar just explode this year, and how would you connect the work you're doing to the anti racism? Well, I think obviously this summer with the racial unrest, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement coming more and more into the consciousness of everyone, this is a topic we're all talking about or we're all becoming aware of. And it touches all of our lives. And so in saying that it touches all of our lives today and how we think and how we're going to move forward and the plans that we make, we have to also then look backwards because we can't all come together 
as one people, as one nation, unless we acknowledge that we have always been one people and one nation, despite the circumstances of that collaboration, despite the fact that there was slavery and there were enslaved people. So by all of you coming here to, today to hear us speak, and for everyone else who has thankfully participated in our events, we are furthering that conversation just, just by having it, just by acknowledging that this is a history that, as David said, that we didn't know, literally that all of us did not know that this was the case right here in East Hampton or on Shelter Island or in Sag Harbor or anywhere in these towns of the Hamptons that we live in. And now that we do know, we can never forget it again. We can never ignore it again. And, and we hope that when you leave here, whoever you talk to when they say, what did you do Saturday afternoon? You'll say, I learned the most amazing things about people I didn't know lived in my very own community. And that's how it goes forward. And so in talking about racial justice, and this is obviously a very simplistic kind of position about it. It's very complicated, obviously, and complex, and we've run out of time, and we probably need drinks. <laughs> but knowing that this history exists, knowing that these individuals lived here, and now you know some of their names, you have to think about it in a different way, I feel. And our hope is that by providing this knowledge, and we're not telling you how to think or what to think, we're just telling you what was and who was here and how you use that information hopefully responsibly will be very important and we'll see where we are next summer and hopefully we'll all come back together again and we'll see what this information has done to our lives yes You know, what's important is to have the conversation. And I know that sounds sort of like a cliche, but in a way, the outcome is less important if, if, if something's renamed um, than having the conversation. Uh, frankly, that's how I feel about reparations. You can throw the money up in the air. It doesn't really matter where it lands. Um, it, it is the, the idea that Americans talk about it and come to some decision. And I, I think there will be more renaming of Shelter Island, I think has just finally changed uh, the, team. the team, which, you know, was a, what was it? Yeah. Uh, but it, you, you mentioned yeah. reparation, and, and I, I do think it's important to talk about reparation, because the, no one ever got the money that they were due. That's yeah, right. Absolutely, and, and it so is a, it's a. Would the Edwards and the Mulfords and the Gardner Consider choking up a bit of dough. We ought to. I mean, I, I tell people that some, you know, sliver of the coin in my pocket can be traced directly to the labor of the enslaved. Um, the slave, uh, I'm using the word, the enslaving, the enslaving families of East Hampton throughout the centuries have remained sort of the sort of upper echelons of, you know, the lawyers, and they own the insurance company, and they used to own the bank, and they used to own the water company, and one of the moments is a goddamn newspaper. And we never had a day of reckoning, you know, in the North. We really didn't. Right. South kind of did. I mean, yeah. it, you know, um, so, but, but we, the, never, we never, we never, we never no. paid. And it's a Jess, process, how are we doing? obviously. Are we, uh, yeah, I think we're at, we're at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We're moving the needle, I think. I really do think we're moving the needle. And I, I think we can change America. I'm not BSing. I really think we can. Yeah, I think we can.
Well, thank you all very, very much yeah, for coming. Yeah, such a pleasure. This was really a pleasure, and thank you again to Duck Creek. <laughs> we do have a Plainside website. We have a Sylvester Manor Educational Farm website, and more information is available. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Again, all of these um, lectures are actually online on our website. And if you don't have a reservation for the concert, we ask you to quickly exit. Thank you. We are limited to 50. Otherwise, I'd say stay forever.